You know, there's almost something sacrilegious about a confirmed Pepsi drinker drinking Jamba Juice. <laughs> but ever since we discovered the 99 cent store, <laughs> There's just too many good deals on healthy drink that you can't help but look at them and go, man, I wonder if that's good for me. <laughs> or if you watch something like Dr. Oz or some other show or you've read about or you have an idea that once you've studied scripture that you should probably should be eating more fruit and vegetables, maybe you decided to partake in some place that you go to, like your Starbucks, only now you go to your juicer bar. <laughs> you go to your, let's see, your alcohol bar for alcohol, your juicer bar for juice, your coffee for Starbucks, and well, you know. But the point being is that it almost seems like unholy or sacrilegious for a Pepsi drinker like me to be drinking Jamba Juice. A man with coconut water and, and all this other junk in it. That tastes pretty good. I guess God knows what he's doing. And you know, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about as we study in Vidivo Spirit, the Spirit of God, because a lot of times we get this whole idea of the Holy Spirit as though that were his name, and yet the first time you hear recorded about God's Spirit, it's the Spirit of God hovered over the waters in Genesis. So if you really wanted to get into kind of understanding that the Spirit of God is a person, you kind of need to get all these different titles in your mind settled and kind of resolved in some place because we want to study it knowing full well that we're never going to come to a complete conclusion about the Holy Spirit as a person. We're going to make assumptions, presumptions, ideas, concepts, but I can't tell you by way of any scripture or even my own personal opinion that at any point in time in the future someone's going to walk up to you and say, Hi, I'm the Holy Spirit. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen that way. And I can't tell you that when you get to heaven, you're going to suddenly point a finger and go, Hey, look, there's the Spirit of God. Meaning pointing at a person or an entity or an angelic being. It's not going to happen that way. You see, we limit ourselves and we try to adapt God to our limitation because we're created as limited beings. God being limitless always has something beyond our comprehension and capability to understand. So when he decided to limit himself in some way for us to understand him, he chose his son to be the example of all about God. So if you ever wanted to understand all about God, you look to Jesus. If you want to see a person, a physical manifestation of the Spirit of God in a person or as a person, you look to Jesus. Now I know that, you know, that Jesus didn't stand up and say, if you see me, you see the Spirit, but in him the fullness of the Spirit dwelt bodily. And you see, that's what it means, is that he manifested himself in Jesus. And because the Father is a spirit, in the same way that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, or you've, yeah, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, when Jesus said that, that being the Spirit of God, likewise, they were like, I hate to say it, but they were like, kind of like cohabitation here, you know, in physical form. Father, Spirit, and Jesus. Kind of cool. All together, in one. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. So, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. It's something that goes beyond understanding, but as you appreciate the fact of the Godhead, that it is obvious that they are three beings that are separate personalities, that are three in one or one God, then if you accept that, God will bring you into more of a grasp of each one individually and begin to understand a perspective. One of the things that I appreciate is that, you know, in studying this with Chuck Smith, you know, through the Living Water book, was that I've already gone through the series, you know, tape. I, I was there when recording, as you know, helped records, well, 
help pass out and distribute you know some of the Holy Spirit series tapes when I was working at Calvary Chapel Tape Learning Library. But I recall there being so many people that were confused about here because they were getting into kind of like break off ministries and they eventually became some that I knew of went off into vineyard and got kind of carried away and became vineyard ministry and then they got carried away and they kind of went off and TVN kind of went you know its way and went off a little bit you know people were kind of like going off or on or whatever but the point being they weren't really trying to get to know the Spirit of God you see there's a difference between the Spirit of God and there's a difference between Jesus and there's a difference between the Father that means that there's a difference, but it also means that there's also a unity and a completeness and a perfection in one. In a echad, complete compound unity of the Godhead. And since Paul explained it, and the Bible explains it, and the scripture said it, I accept it. But the point being, I'm always one of those people who ask questions. So what I helped, or what I hoped in this series, Medieval Spirit, was to present the questions I asked as well as the factual basis that I accept what Chuck Smith has taught, you know, and related as much as he knows, and then the things that maybe I've learned along the way or added to, or maybe, you know, I haven't taken anything from, believe me, don't have to. Chuck's pretty safe. He takes his facts from Scripture, and that's it, and I can tell you what's on Scripture and what's not, you know. And so, in sharing that, and in learning this, and presenting it to you in video Spirit, I've been learning some things by the Spirit of God. I mean, it sounds a little weird, but <laughs> he's been teaching me some things about himself. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, huh, you know, a little bit, well, greatly humbled, but then a little bit amazed by that. Some of the thoughts that he causes me to learn or to comprehend. Because when you yield yourself to opportunity to learn with God, then God will meet you where you're at, and he'll take you a step farther. He's going to take you step by step as long as you're willing to accept rather than reject what he's saying or what he's doing or how he is or what he's manifesting to you at the time. Because God's perspective is always manifest through his word, through his person, and through his spirit. There are three that bear witness, you know, in heaven, and you know, you can get into the water, the blood, and the fire, and all that stuff. But the point is, is that he will take you someplace you've never been before if you're willing to listen, hear, understand, comprehend, and make the connections in your soul and your spirit beyond just your thought process. Because in the same way that you're, we mentioned this over and over and over again, and it bears repeating, although I know it probably sounds old if you've heard Vidivo Spirit enough times. But in the same way that you take in your ear hearing and it's interpreted into words and concepts and images and thought processes in your brain and those are caused by two electrodes that are sitting apart from each other and then there's a chemical in between that if the chemical is messed up then you get some really messed up thoughts. But if it's accurate then there's a little spark goes back and forth and that causes your thought process to happen. Well, the same thing is true in some way of there being something that's like an electrode on one side and something else on the other side, which is probably God, you know, and physical, you know, <laughs> or soulful, if we want to put it there, spirit. We'll say soul, because there's a physical connection between soul and physical, and then a spiritual connection between spirit and soul. So we'd have to say some kind of connection that in between there's something that connects it. Well, when you get to the spiritual side of that connection, one side is spirit of God, the, or the chemical in between is the spirit of God. So you'd have an analogy and a metaphor that would work correctly. So unless the Spirit of God is there in you, causing that connection to go from spirit to soul, you won't understand it spiritual matter, spiritual things. You'll only kind of get a kind of an inkling sci-fi wise or kind of a you know, speculative idea imaginatively, but it's kind of interesting that because I've opened up to that, literally the Spirit of God has kind of began to show me things. Well, Showing is a word, wrong word because the revelation of God is for God the Father to do, but the comprehension of things is from the Spirit of God to do. And as the Spirit of God gives you comprehension, then you begin to know things and understand them in an expansion way of your mind and begins to go, wow, and then your eyes are open, then you see things that the Father reveals. So it's kind of 
interesting for me personally as we're going through this video spirit because I'm learning. Is that that's the main point? And so one of the things that I learned was that, to put it bluntly, was that you know we call him the Holy Spirit, but it would be probably better to comprehend him as the Spirit of God. A lot of things that people do when they say the Holy Spirit, they don't always use really holy in the meaning that God intended, nor spirit. So when you say Spirit of God, at least you get a better comprehension of who you're talking to. Not a what, not a it, not a thing, not a vague whisper or vesper of wind, not an essence, but the Spirit of God. And so, he kind of impressed that upon me and told me about that today, as I was kind of thinking about this. And likewise, he showed me something because we're studying on the will, which was a very short section that we're going to read and then you know, talk about. But he kind of impressed upon me that his will will not always strive against my will. The same way that Jesus had the opportunity in the Garden of Gethsemane to say, not my will, but thy will be done, your will is influencing how much of God, by his Spirit, will work in your life. The Holy Spirit does not override your will. He allows you the choice. Just like in the Garden of Gethsemane, you have your own garden in your soul. It's a garden spot where you alone are at peace with God. And in that peaceful place of communion with God the Father, the Spirit of God comes, and then it's your choice whether to acknowledge Him and to yield your will to Him or to take your will and force things to happen. And that's where you get into these people that exercise gifts of the Spirit by trying to force the will of God and the Spirit of God to do their will, not his will. Because the Spirit of God, we're told, has a will. He has the ability to do things and give things and to cause us to understand things based upon his own choice and decision-making process of how to bring us to a conclusion of where we're at to understand him better or to understand Jesus better, which is what he points out, or truth, or man manifest those things. So, you have a will. You have a determination that you can make on your own. That same will, the Holy Spirit has one. That same will, the Father has one. That same will, Jesus has one. You need to think about that for a while. Because sometimes in your life, a lot of what happens to you is caused by you. It's your will being done. Not God's, not Jesus, not the Spirit's. You see, the Father's will is that all should be saved. Doesn't mean all will be saved, but that all should be saved because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, not will not perish. Should not perish, but come to but have everlasting life. If they have the son, then they have life. But there's also a will of the son, you see, because Jesus said, not everyone that comes to me and says, "Lord, Lord," will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But those that do the will of my Father, notice that what he says, the will of my Father which is in heaven. What was the will of Jesus? Jesus' will was to do those things that please his Father. That's what Jesus' will is. So that's where we get our determination of what we want to do for the Father. We decide, do we want to take up our cross, deny ourselves, or in this case, deny our will, crucify our will, and deny ourselves. So, you have a choice daily to make, which is, will you do the will of God? Will you do the will of the Father? Will you do the will of the Son? Will you do the will of the Spirit? The will of the Son was pretty simple. You know, make known His words to share the good news, to heal the sick, raise the dead, to, you know, feed the poor, to help the needy, you know, to be there as a representative of Jesus. And if you did those things that he told you to do, then he would say, Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked and poor, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came and saw me. And those things are his will. 
God's will is salvation. His will is to perform, you would say, the religious life of a believer. Now, the Spirit of God is interesting. He has a will for us. What is His will? That's the interesting thing. Working towards that comprehension is why I will leave it there for you to think about till we discuss this video a little spirit again. But think about that now. You've got the Father's will and you've got the Son's will. Now, what is the Spirit's will for you? You see, the Spirit, we're told, will not always strive with man. So, is the Spirit of God striving with you to accomplish His will? Or are you trying to do your will and force His hand? Are you trying to take authority unto yourself when it's said that the Spirit will give as He chooses, not as you determine? You see, when the four and twenty elders throw down their crowns, I think that should be telling us something, that we give back our authority if it's given to us. We give back to God anything that's been given to us. We don't keep it for ourselves. We were never given stuff for our own possession. We were given gifts, fruit, manifestations of God himself to reveal to other people, to give to them that they would pass on to another. There's an old song that we used to sing in the Jesus movement that said, it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around are warmed up by its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. And you know, that's what all of our life as a Christian is meant to be. Pass it on. That simple. Pass it on. Your faith, your hope, your love, your mercy, your kindness, your gentleness, your meekness, your temperance. You're meant to pass it on. In discussing the Holy Spirit, in discussing the Spirit of God, we're talking about Him as a personality and His will. The Holy Spirit is also said to have a will. In talking about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul said that the Holy Spirit distributes to each one individually as He wills in verse 11. Why don't you look that up? Make sure I'm quoting it correctly. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'll get another sip of juice. Almost as good as Pepsi. It is the Holy Spirit who decides what kind of spiritual gift each believer should receive. This act of choosing demands that he have a will. And in Acts 15.28, the apostles prefaced their judgment on a question of church doctrine by saying, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Interesting. In so saying, they ascribe to the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the same kind of judgment-making ability which they themselves possess. On some occasions, the Bible says the Spirit forbade his servants to visit certain areas, thus demonstrating his will. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Acts 16, 6 and 7. Only persons with a will are able to forbid men from taking certain course of action or just to disallow them from enacting another plan. Yet the Holy Spirit did both, making it clear he is a person with a will. Now, I'll be honest, you know, I mean, we can talk theoretical if we want to. We can talk about anything if we want to. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Cat got your tongue? Oh, well, I'll talk about the spirit then. <laughs> Funny how that works. But having a will, we only know that he's a person by comparison to our will to 
God's will and to those things that have a will. We only use that comparatively because that's the most that we comparatively understand. If there is more, we don't know. And that's where I like to share with you the reality of the truth. It doesn't say specifically, you know, hey, there's the Holy Spirit anywhere in Scripture, except for, like I made the analogy for you, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Spirit of God. So, except for that, I don't think you're going to find some solid, you know, like what you might want to sink your teeth in to go, yes, the Spirit of God is a person because of boom, boom, boom. No, you're going to have to go with this idea, of, well, if it's a will, and if it's this, and if it's that, you know, and there may be more when you get to heaven, so don't be surprised. I mean, for me, I'm pretty confident about who the Spirit of God is, and I'm pretty confident about Him being a person. I have no problem with that. I have absolute confidence in everything that Chuck Smith teaches, you know, I have no problem with that. Um, I may expand on it some more, you know, as I have learned in my own studies, but in my comprehension as the Spirit of God has been showing me or, or tell, you know, kind of telling me things, it's been more like more, you know, I, I keep getting this impression of more and expansive, meaning that it's probable that the Spirit of God is greater in magnitude than we can comprehend in limitude or limitude. Meaning that our perception can only see within a certain realm. Like, I can't see 360 right now. And if I could see 360, I couldn't see the other way 360. In other words, I can't see all places at all times all at once. And I suspect, though the Spirit is not a force, his greatness is so manifest that it's probable that he's bigger in ways of our not understanding. I don't understand. <laughs> yep, nope, nope, nope. Nope, nope. But he's probably bigger than we could ever really get a handle on and that he can't limit himself in any other way except in Jesus and except in portions of himself as he possesses us or fills us with his spirit because frankly I think that he's you know hey he's kind of like the big guy you know not so big as God not so big as uh, Jesus but they you know he's pretty big but the point being is that whenever I'm learning more in talking with him and yielding myself to his will I get the feeling of more peace I mean not peace like what we normally think but just it stretches out in ways I never dreamed of or imagined and it kind of makes you go uh, you know like kind of like stretching out balloon going in every direction and it's really an interesting feeling it's beyond the soul and that's I mean I've had a piece that passes all understanding when I got saved then when I was filled when I was baptized Holy Spirit I had a piece that passes all understanding beyond understanding when I got baptized Holy Spirit <laughs> but more than that more than that the fruit of the peer, the fruit of the spirit, as he has in filled me, is like that expansion part. It's just like just ooh, you just go in every direction, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's something that I don't think that we'll ever know. I know that it, the best way that I could describe it is going to really freak somebody out out there because I'm going to say. Well, one time when I was kind of like laying there and talking to God, you know, and God all of a sudden decided to reveal himself to me, I froze for like maybe a couple hours without breathing and didn't breathe. You know, now it's, you know, people don't understand that, but someday I'll tell you about it. <laughs> maybe in this series. But it was a real interesting experience. <laughs> I learned what the fear of the Lord is. That's the only way to describe it, was what I experienced because I could not teach on the fear of the Lord but now I can teach on the fear of the Lord. <laughs> I have no problem with knowing what that is. It's not terror or fear in the normal way, but boy, is it like, wow, it's a wowzer. But the only way I could describe the fullness of peace was like to be able to just be still, to stop and not breathe or not move or not have a thought or not anything for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, things that are impossible to do. <laughs> It's the only way I can comprehend it. So if you're really a sci-fi nut, you know, and you're really into kind of like that kind of concept of eternal now, and like, 
then you might get it. That's the best way I would describe it. And that's just the peace part. Now, I kind of been getting more of this God is wanting me to focus on peace more than the love because yes, there's love and joy that you know God does do, you know. Kinda they're part of it, but peace is part of love and so is joy. But anyways, we won't go there. But with the Spirit of God, well, at least not now. But with the Spirit of God showing me these things, it's like he's been wanting to bring and to stop people from the violence of their ways and thoughts and attitudes and actions to the place of peace, which is a, a cessation of time, really. And it's a stopping and an eternality of existence in the comprehensive being that you are at this moment. And I know I lost everybody on that one. All right, I was real quick. I like, they went, whoa, what? <laughs> Where did you come up with those words? It's a Jewish thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, supernal, you know, kind of like Tanya, you know, like, hey, we, we do Tanya. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, the Rebbe says, uh, Rebbe. <laughs> but anyways, but the Spirit of God seems to be bringing about this complete contradiction to what we are, you know, living in the age that we are now, which is a very violent age, a very... Noahic age, which was all about violence and violent means, and you know, probably. Well, look at the way that we do things. Everything is by violence. You know, you have to put fire into steel. You know, and make it and beat it and sharpen it and grind it and tear it up. You know, it's not peaceful. You know, it's not speaking peace. You know, or creating things. It's kind of like destroying things in order to make them into our own image. But the spirit of God have been impressing upon me not just peace but his will and that's why I said if I can inspire you to study study the will of the Spirit of God the Spirit's will what is the Spirit's will for you he's not just a sugar daddy to you know go ah, come here spirit I want to be baptized A I want to be baptized B I want all your fruits and C I want all your gifts you know and eh, it doesn't work that way because there's also a part that's kind of a warning. It says that his spirit would not always strive with man or against man. And so I feel that there's this strong warning coming that God is saying, uh, the Holy Spirit, meaning God, meaning not just the Spirit of God, meaning not just God the Father or God the Son, but the Spirit of God is saying, um, back up, back off, no more. We're not doing that now. We're not going to go running out, you know, and blasting things. We're not going to run out and call down fire from heaven. We're going to peace, love, incorporate joy. And I see that powerfully in Jesus himself as he walked on the earth. Moments of miraculous but not the transfiguration that Peter James and John saw on the mountaintop but rather the Spirit of God very peace filling to everyone around where Jesus was at that there was something emanating as though it could influence our emotions and our soul and bring us to the place of God because you see, God said, be still and know that I am God. And I believe that was meant for the Spirit of God. Not this hype up worship in a very, you know, let's crank up the amps, you know, and we can make the bass really inspire us. Or, you know, the lyrics are written in such a way that, you know, hey, it's going to trigger memory. But a place of Father, I thank you that you've given us your spirit. I thank you that he is here, that he is real, that he is the fullness of you manifested in the spirit. That, Father, even as you have given the fullness of the spirit of God to your son, you have given us the fullness of the measure of the spirit 
that he determines for each and every one of us to hold in a vessel that our flesh is, that we should be inhabited and knowledgeable of the Spirit of God as he fills us and allows us to know him as he points to you. God, help us to see Jesus, but more so, help us to understand and comprehend what is the riches and the depth of your glory as you've revealed it to your prophets, to your teachers, through your Son, and by your Spirit to each and every one of us. God, give us the measure of your Spirit as you have determined for the Comforter to come and to be with us in these last days that we live in. For surely as the last generation, God, we see the time is at hand. Help us to be sensitive now, more so than ever before to your spirit, than we would be to say the things of the world, or even the hearing of the ear or the seeing of the eye. For without your spirit, O oh God, we would not be able to know the difference between the voice of the world and the voice of God. Teach us, O oh Lord, to be still and help us to comprehend the things of the Spirit. God bless you. I hope you got some real things to think about. I know I've been kind of like, hmm, this is cool for a little while now. <laughs> and uh, I keep looking at that Jamba Juice. <laughs> it's like, Jamba, Jamba. No, but as the Spirit of God leads you, there may be things He'll tell you and teach you more so or less so than many of us or me or someone else. But it's as He chooses. So be sure to understand and grasp the reality that you need to make a choice, not just with salvation, with the Father, not just with lordship, with Jesus, in serving him in a religious way, and not just with the Spirit of God, with receiving from him, but yielding your will to the will of God as he reveals it to you.